pray this for all of us, Lord. We are all troubled uh, and worried about many things, Lord. But we know that you are in control over all things. And there's nothing you cannot do. Something's about to change. And that you have all wisdom. And you work all things together for our good. So we trust all these things to you. In Jesus' name. Please stand with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Invite the uh, ushers forward to collect our tithes and offerings. Pastor, I have to ask you one question before I. We have a special music number we want to share here. Simple question Are you still preaching from Romans 6, 1 through 11? I am. Okay, perfect. The title changed, I think, during the week, and a lot of our music today is going to focus on uh, being set free from sin, but we'll see what the Lord is planning here. Uh, this one is called Redeemed.
For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Let's worship the Lord.
prayer, but this time I'd like to just close with one chorus that I think sums up our response to you setting us free. Yeah. Just this is one chorus.
And uh, chapter 6 here, he's kind of, Paul's picking up right off of the end of chapter 5. And uh, in verse 20 of chapter 5, he says, Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Or where sin increased, grace increased much more. And here in chapter 6, Paul anticipates a question that he knows some Christians will ask. Well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul knows that some are going to conclude in a very weird backwards way that, that well, if grace increases and as sin increases, well, then the more I sin, the more grace there will be. Wonderful. Well, then I'll just keep on going and there'll be more grace, right? And, and Paul shows in the rest of this chapter here why this is such a terrible miscalculation. Grace is not a license to sin. And as verse 11 said, as is where our finishing verse today, those who are in Christ Jesus must reckon themselves dead to sin. And to reckon, catch that from our title there, reckoning, reckon means to consider or to conclude, to calculate, and I got this phrase, dead reckoning, that is an ocean navigation term. Uh, and dead reckoning is a way of calculating your ship's current position based on your direction and your speed. And you're, you, so you, you go step by step, okay, we've moved this fast in this direction away from this position, so now we must be here. And this is kind of an old school way of finding your, you know, your position before we had GPS and satellites to tell us all these things. Um, but you also had to calculate for things that cause you to drift, winds and currents, because you might say, hey, okay, we went this fast, this direction, so we must be here, but you might have been pushed different ways. It might not actually be where you are. So in dead reckoning, it's very easy to have, get error, to, to be off by me if you leave out important factors. But even if all your corrections or your calculations are perfect, if your starting position is wrong, then everything else you calculate is just going to be even more wrong. And Paul is saying here, if you think that that grace gives you a license to sin, you, just, you haven't made just a, a miscalculation. You are starting in the wrong place. Place. You don't even know your, your correct starting position. And so Paul here, he presents us with, with the facts of why the, the, the previous conclusion is unthinkable. It's, un, it's not a possible conclusion to come to. And he does this by establishing our, our true starting position. And then he, step by step, he calculates out from there what is our true current position. So we're going to follow Paul verse by verse through this here to see how you too must reckon yourself dead to sin but alive to God. So in verse 2, Paul, he presents us with just the impossibility of continuing in sin. How can we who die to sin still live in it? And the, the phrase license to sin is Total contradictory nonsense. And it would, it would be like finding out there's a cure for cancer, a perfect cure for lung cancer, and deciding, well, I'm going to chain smoke then, because the worse my lung cancer is, the more proof that the cure works, right? Or if you had two countries who were at war, right? Like, like there really is out there. And suppose they, they sign an unbreakable peace treaty. They, they just signed an unbreakable peace treaty. That, that they won't break it for anything. And so one, one lone warship decides, oh, hey, they won't break this, this peace treaty for anything. That means I can, I can fire all my missiles and just cause all sorts of destruction. And nothing will break this treaty. So let's do it. You know, fire everything. You know, it, it's ridiculous. And both these examples here, are, none of them, though, are as ridiculous as this idea as living in something that we've died to. And, and so Paul presents this. This is a ridiculous idea. Uh, but to show us that we have, in fact, died to sin, Paul goes back 
to the beginning. So, so verse 3, he takes us back to our, our starting position. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Paul is saying here, as the rest of Scripture confirms, in baptism we come into fellowship with Christ. We are made partakers in his redemption. And partakers means to share the benefits of. So the last weeks, people have brought my family a lot of pies. Delicious, wonderful pies. And I have definitely eaten a slice of that pie. When I ate that pie, I was partaking in that pie. I didn't bake that pie. I'm not a participant in that pie. I am a partaker in that pie. That is, so we are partakers in his redemption. And it's and in baptism, God's word is connected with the water. And by faith in his word, we receive what his word is doing in the water. God's word in baptism connects you with Christ's death. That's what verse 3 says. It connects you with his death. And now Christ's historical death is for the forgiveness of your sins. We emphasize that a lot. Your substitute. But God is saying also in baptism, you are Connected, you are joined with his death. God changes something in you. And this is a mystical, unseen work of God in your heart. But it is just as real as Jesus' death was. God makes you de dead to sin because he joins you to Jesus' death. So this is Paul's starting point as he reckons out our new position. So here we go. So in baptism, God makes you dead to sin because he joins you to Jesus. This is our the starting position that we're calculating, that we're reckoning from. Verse 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So baptism, it connects us, as we see in this verse, it connects us with all three parts of Jesus' work of redemption. His de death, his burial, and his resurrection. And burial is important because it marks the certainty of the death. So those who are, those who do the burial make sure the person's really dead. And, but it's also done by another. Dead people don't bury themselves, right? Someone else has to do their burial. And also, burial is a is a separation of the dead away from the living. And baptism is your spiritual burial to sin. And this is not your work. You know, you don't bury yourself. It is God's work in you. In baptism, he buries you into Jesus' death. So you are spiritually dead to sin, buried away from sin's authority and power. But baptism also makes us alive to God. God buries us into Jesus' death in order to connect us with his resurrection. It says Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So, so that, that represents all God's, his power, his glory, the life of Almighty God himself. That is what raised Jesus from the dead. And that is also what gives us newness of life. And this is, isn't merely, you know, more life or life again. This is a new kind of life. Life empowered by the glory of God. And when we think of our loved ones who get sick, all the people we, we pray for today and then others that you know, you know, we don't just want their affliction to end. We also want them to recover and to regain strength and health. We don't just stop and go, oh, okay, hey, the cancer is gone. It's good enough. We're going to stop caring. Like, no, no, we want to see them strong and thriving, right? Like, when my sons get bad colds, you know, I, I don't want just the colds to end. I want them to be growing and to be strong and thriving and to flourish. And God doesn't merely make us dead to sin, although that would be a big, that is a big deal in itself. 
but he makes us alive in relationship to him so that we can walk in newness of life. And to walk in newness of life, to walk in means to show evidence of life. Stones don't get up and walk around. Living creatures walk. And God has connected us in baptism with Jesus' resurrection life. And he's done this so that you can walk in the newness of life today. Here's our, the two points from this verse here, our two takeaways. You are spiritually dead to sin, buried away from the and power, and he has connected you with his resurrection life, so you can walk in newness of life in your life today. In verse 5, he's going to move to a connected idea here. He says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So verse 4 earlier, he was talking about the present benefit of newness of life, the life we live out now, today. But in verse 5, he's looking forward to our immortal life, our immortal resurrection. And the word united here literally means been grown together. And so it's the idea that two things so closely grow together that their life is shared. They're still separate and different. Our death is not Jesus' death. Jesus' death was in the body for our sin. Our death is in the spirit to sin, but is a death like his. And also this word, word united is, is passive. It says been grown together. So he's not telling command, he's saying grow into Jesus. He's saying, no, God, God comes and grows you together with him. It's God's grace. He grows you together. And he also says then that you know what? It doesn't rely on how well you've done it or how well you walk this walk afterwards. It's God's work that has united you with Jesus' death and his life. And he's done this by the power of his word. Not, not even the power of his word. The same word that created something out of nothing, that called into existence things that never were before, that makes dead things alive. And his word in baptism united you in a death like Jesus' death. And therefore, he says, you will certainly be united with a resurrection like his. Meaning that after your bodily death, you will be resurrected in Jesus' glory when he comes again. And this is such a comfort against all our fears of death. And whether we're concerned about death because we're, we're counting our years and we're, we we're watching death is death around the corner or not, or, or maybe we're relatively young and but we're afflicted by disease or by an accident or by a random act of violence. Against all these fears of death, God gives a certain hope our resurrection from the dead in Jesus Christ. But the starting bit of that resurrection, that's the final destination. That's the place we're headed to. But our starting position, that is baptism with Jesus. And so he says here, we can live free from sin's power now. We can walk in the new life. But we also have confidence of the resurrection to come. Verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Clear the joke there. <laughs> um, so, our old self, the old self, that is our old, our sinful human nature that every human inherited from Adam. And that all people naturally act upon unless God changes something. And uh, there's an illustration from Star Wars that I like. Um, in, in Star Wars, the Galactic Republic creates a huge army of clone soldiers. 
And every single soldier is identical to the other, and they're all clothed from one source. They're all taken from that one source. So they all share this one soldier nature. And they've been programmed, their, their nature, their DNA's been tweaked and, and programmed to make them perfect soldiers. They're compliant to command, but they're, they're adaptable and fierce in combat. So they're supposed to be these perfect soldiers. Um, it is interesting because as, as they age, they do develop different personalities just based on their different experiences and who's leading them and, and the, 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 the desire to be distinct from one another. Um, but, but they still all share the same common soldier nature. And that nature has been programmed and it's been programmed to obey the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic and to fight against the enemy. And the enemy in this case is an army of droids. And so the soldiers, they hate the droids. <laughs> they, they really hate them. Um, and they think they're the good guys. They think they're the ones who are saving the Republic. But all along, they're actually part of the, the Chancellor's master plan to create the Empire. And they have something implanted in them. In addition to all that programming of their DNA, there's something literally implanted in them so that when the chancellor calls, they unquestionably obey, even betraying anyone. And even if some of them start to suspect this and have those implants removed, though, they still have this core nature, the soldier nature that's just written into their DNA. They are programmed to fight for the Republic, fight against the droids. And it's this nature that relates to us. Because um, all of us have inherited a nature from Adam. And humanity was created as, as a good thing, a good creation. But and we were made to live in perfect love and harmony with God. That's what we were created to be and made as. So humanity is a good thing. But our nature, ever since Adam, has been completely corrupted through with sin. And that sin nature now, that, that corruption, it inclines us every instance to fight for ourselves, selfishly for ourselves, and to fight against God. Our, our inclination, our reaction is that hey, we are not interested in God, and we resent that he claims authority, authority over our lives, over every area of our lives. And our natural inclination when we hear that, that God has, has righteousness expectations, like the Ten Commandments we read together today, those things, our natural reaction is to resent that. And in baptism, our old sin nature was crucified with Christ. Now, he's not saying that nature is gone. That would be great news. But... He is saying it is crucified with Christ. Its power is defeated. Its power has been defeated and dead. And this phrase, the next phrase here, the body of sin. Well, that phrase represents the whole person controlled by sin in every aspect. And that, the body of sin, has been brought to nothing. It doesn't function result of this is you are no longer enslaved to sin. The relationship has changed. The old sin nature doesn't rule you anymore. And even before we knew Christ, before we were made his, that, that old sin nature was so indistinguishable, so, so present in us, it seemed indistinguishable from ourselves. But now you are aware of it. Now you can name it. Now you can fight back and sin now is like a, a slave master trying to command a dead slave. No matter what it does, the dead slave is not going to respond. Or to, to go back to the, the Star Wars metaphor, you know, the commander, he calls out and says, hey, why isn't clone trooper 555 obeying the command? Well, because he, he's dead, sir. <laughs> oh, 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 of course, dude, never mind, carry on. <coughs> uh, in baptism, your old sin nature was put to death. And your relationship with sin changed. Sin does not dominate your life anymore. It might trip you up. It might cause you to stumble. But it is not in charge. It's not calling the shots. Um, 
とかないですか Verse 7. I was going to say it again, but emphasizing something a little different here. The one who has died has been set free from sin. And it, this phrase does not mean, it's not a universal thing that means that everyone who dies is set free from sin. Because remember, Paul, remember our context, Paul is reckoning out our current position step by step from that starting point. Baptized into Jesus' death and therefore dead to sin. So when he says the one who has died, he's talking about that one, that one who has died to sin with Jesus. That one has been set free from sin. And, and the, the original word that's been translated set free here is, is the same word for justification. And, and the strength of the word means effective forever. And, and so that's why we call it. Translated set free, and it's talking about the result. The, the word is justified and, and, and effectively justified forever. So we could, we could say this another way. The one who has died with Jesus has been justified from sin and remains justified from sin. Continually so. So what broke the power of sin over us? It was the death of Jesus for us that justified us from sin so that sin has no condemnation over you. That is what sets us free from sin. Jesus' justification for you. And uh -oh. Paul is going to keep explaining Jesus' work of justification and its significance here in verse 9. Verse 8. Sorry. Verse 8. So, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And here he, he moves us more personally to us, to your faith, to what you believe. These aren't just cold facts. These are truths that change your heart. They give you faith and confidence. He says, we will live with him. We live in the newness of life now, and we have full confidence we will live with him in resurrection glory. And, and this belief is based on reliable facts. And you can think of when you use GPS to, to try to get to a place you have never been to before. And we might ask, well, do you know you're going the right way? Do you know the destination actually really exists? You don't personally know. You've never been there before. But you have good reason to believe you are on, on the correct route to get there. You have reliable information. Or to think back to our using our going back to ships on the sea again. You know, on the sea there are no road signs, there's no turns, there's no landmarks, it's just blue water in every direction. But if the navigator knows he has correctly plotted position and the direction and the speed that he can with full confidence say I believe we are on the right course and so this I believe is not wishful thinking it is belief it's faith based on truth and facts verse 9 we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again Death no longer has dominion over him. We know. That word, we know, and we understand the significance of Jesus' resurrection. Because when we think about Jesus' resurrection, it is, it is different from any other resurrection. We think of the other resurrection that the people that Jesus raised from the dead. Think of Lazarus or Jairus' daughter. You know, those people were brought back to life. But they got it again later. You know, they're, they're not still walking around out there two centuries later. They did. Eventually they died again. They weren't freed from their mortality. But Jesus' death here is different. When he died, he died to his mortality. When he was raised, he was raised immortal. Death has no more authority over him. Death has no power over him. 
We think of us that we none of us can escape death. When, when death comes, we cannot resist it. Our soul will leave our body. Death has dominion over our existence. But it has no power over Jesus. Jesus has become the Lord over death. And verse 10 explains why. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lived to God. So often we teach about Jesus dying for sins. He is the sacrifice for your sins, your substitute. But in this verse, Paul is emphasizing that Jesus died to sin. Jesus changed the relationship between you and your sins. And he did this by taking your relationship to sin upon himself. Because by taking the condemnation for sin upon himself, he came into relationship with your sin. And because he came into relationship with your sin, he came under the power of condemnation and under the power of death. But when he died, he severed all relationship with sin and condemnation. So that they have nothing more to do with him. He has nothing to do with them. And it says he did this once for all. He is the perfect sacrifice who died for all sin. And so his death ended all relationship with sin and condemnation. So when he rose again from the dead, he broke the power of death. He broke it. Because death is, is the consequence of sin and condemnation. But Jesus has no relationship to these things. He has no relationship with sin and condemnation. So death has no dominion over him. Instead, he is now the Lord over death. And his resurrection shows that. It shows he has conquered death. And that his resurrection life now reigns and rules. And because his own resurrection is to a new immortal life, he can share that life all those who are in him and with him. This immortal life, he lives to God. He lives in relation to God. All Jesus' life is lived in an orbit around God. Around God's righteous glory. He lives for him and to him and through him. And th this is the nature of his resurrected life. It is defined by his relationship to God the Father. And because he lives completely for God, he empowers you to begin to live for him as well. In verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Paul brings us back to what we must conclude about ourselves. What is our current position. Does grace give us a license to sin? The answer is clearly no. Grace has changed us. We are dead to sin. By baptism we have been united with Jesus. We've been united with his death. And his death it justified us from sin so that we are forgiven and sin cannot condemn us, but that death also changed us and changed our relationship to sin. We are free from sin's power to control us. We are no longer slaves to sin. Jesus died to sin, and we died with him to sin. So when sin calls, we don't have to respond. We don't have to answer. The dead are, are unresponsive, and we are dead to sin. We're unresponsive to sin. And, in, and to choose to continue to sin, that is to, to surrender part of the victory that Jesus has won for you. It's like, it's like jumping back into the toxic waste that he cured you from. And we also don't have a license to sin because God has made you alive to God, alive to his righteousness. And, and that means we are alive to his power. We respond to his righteousness. We walk in him. We live in relationship to him. And this is the, the strength and vitality and flourishing we have in him. That we can live in him. 
And now the, the immortal life, that is still to come at the resurrection. But life, the power for a righteous life is now for you with Jesus. And we don't do this righteous life perfectly. That old sin nature, although defeated, is still present. It's still like a it's still like it's a dead weight chain to you there. You're still dragging it around. You still trip and stumble over it. But when we do stumble over it, we have God's word that confirms our true position. Because God, by God's word in baptism, you are with Jesus. And with him, you are dead to sin. With him, you are alive to God. And he says you must Consider yourself this way because God considers you this way because in Jesus you are. We thank God for his grace to us in Jesus that makes us dead to sin but alive to God. Amen. We're going to uh, sing together hymn 412. There is a fountain filled with blood.
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction from 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts and every good work and word. Amen. The grace of God be with you all. Amen. Mm -hmm.